search my heart, search my soul. How many of you know that's the words we need to be saying? Amen. David said, search my heart. See if there anything in is unclean. I tell you, sometimes we just need to do some soul searching sometimes. Amen. Not the spirit. Don't get it twisted. The soul. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 says that we are a spirit, soul, and body. And the soulish realm is what we need to get renewed by the word of God. Amen. We need to be continuously renewing our mind, our will, and our emotions to the truth of God's word. And so sometimes that takes inventory. Come on. Amen. We got to get aside and we got to say, Lord, what's going on in my emotions? And I like to say it this way. Your emotions are the caboose. What you're thinking on ultimately is where your emotions will follow. And so, you know, the other day, Tara, my wife was talking about something and she said, Something was going on. It wasn't a real big deal, but I could see she was getting worked up. I said, quit thinking on it. <laughs> she looked at me. I said, think on something else. Amen. I said, your emotions are going to follow your dominant thought pattern. Amen. That's why Paul said, think on these things. Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is a good report. He said, think on these things. I tell you, when things start coming against me and I'm starting to find my emotions or getting a little bit out of, out of whack, you know what? That's a warning sign. I'm not in the spirit. I need to get my mind focused on him because in Isaiah, he said, those who keep his mind on him are in perfect peace. And I say this all the time. If your peace is disturbed, guess what? Your mind's not on him. You need to get your mind back on him. You need to get your mind focused on, on him and his word and things like that. And so I just wanted to share that with you. But if you've just now joined us, we've been in a series that I've titled One Church. And... Um, we're going through the book of Acts, a study through the book of Acts, and at this rate, we'll get finished in 2016. Come on, amen. I think we've made it right through the first chapter of, of or the first, yeah, the first chapter. So if you want to turn there, um, and I said this in the beginning, um, uh, where's, um, Ronnie, will you get me a glass of water? Thank you, sir. I said this in the beginning, I said, there's, there's a theme in the book of Acts, and I said I like to say it sums it up best in three words. I said there was an ascension. That's when we know that Jesus went to be with the Father, and he talked about uh, to his disciples that he had to go, and he said yeah, it's better that I go because when I go, how many know he said the comforter will come, and that's what we're building up to. So there was the ascension. Then we know in Acts chapter 2 there was the descension. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for the Holy Ghost? And so we know that the descension was when the when the Holy Ghost was poured out in Acts chapter 2. But then I said from that point on, really, the Acts of the Apostles is the, is the, is the study of the extension. And that's where the Apostles literally took uh, the power that they were endued with from on high. Come on, amen. And they begin to live a life full of victory and they begin to radically flip their world as they knew it upside down. Amen. It was just a few of them and they radically changed the world. And how many of you know that's what we were called to do? And so I, I said this, I said, there's power in unity. Come on, amen. There's power and unity. There's something about when we come together as corporate believers and begin to get on one accord, y'all ain't hearing me tonight, that the, the power of God begins to manifest itself. And I believe this, that there's not more manifestations of God's power and glory simply because we're not on one accord. Because there's division in the church. Because so-and-so is talking about so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so don't like my hat today, and probably talking about it, amen? Well, it's not your hat. It's mine. Amen? I call, I call Brother Bert a Pharisee. He was calling. <laughs> I'm picking on Bert. But, but we're joking, but seriously, people split churches over this. People split churches over the color that you paint the bathroom walls. Come on, amen? You've, you've, you've been a part of it. You know, they go around and they stir up division. I, and Paul said, mark those who cause division. I mark them. I'm going to tell you right up front. I love you and smile at you, but I'm watching you. And if you're causing division here, I won't have no problem with sitting down with you and telling you, we love you, but I wish you'd find somewhere else to go. Because we're not going to disrupt the peace that we have here. Amen? Amen? Because that's what the scriptures tell me to do as a pastor, as a shepherd. I am shepherding your souls. And one day I'm going to give an account for each and every one of you. I take that very serious. I might dress a little different than your average pastor. I might talk a little different. But I'm very serious about my call. I'm very serious about the mandate on my life. I'm very serious about the day that hands were laid on me and I was set into the gospel ministry. That's one thing I don't joke about. 
I'm very serious about that. And so I, I, to me, I'm, I'm a shepherd over this flock, and I, I take that very seriously. And I'm not going to let people come in here and disrupt that. Amen? I'm not going to let people come in here and talk bad about you to me. I stop that. I believe in Matthew 18. Amen? Go to your brother in private. That's what's wrong with the church today. I don't know why I'm getting on this, but it's good. That's what's wrong today. And, you know, I said this, I said this not too long ago. You know, the Lord gave me an assignment for Lake City. I'm an implant here, but... I believe God called me here, and I can see his hand on my ministry. But one of the things that the Lord showed me was, Sean, you're going to plant a unique church, and it was going to be designed for the unchurched. And so, you know what? I don't mind people coming from other fellowships because it takes other believers to come and, and, and support this vision. But how many of you know this, this isn't what I designed this church for, not for the transferring of saints? Amen? And see, that's what we have today. We have a bunch of people that go to one church and they, they don't adhere to leadership and they don't submit to anybody and they go and they stir up all kinds of stuff. And then, you know what, there's no accountability. So now I'm just going to go from that church to this church. Come on, amen. Y'all don't get quiet in this Presbyterian church. Then they go to this church and they stir up a bunch of stuff. And then when they get finally find out about them, then they go to the next church and they drag that baggage. Come on, amen. And nobody's ever accountable to anybody. So I like to know, where are you from? Why are you here? Amen. <laughs> we love you. You're welcome. But we just want to know why you're here. Well, you know, most of you have come from different churches, and I've heard your story, and, and uh, you know, I'm fine with that. But, you know, these are things that we have to talk about. You know, the seeker-friendly churches today, pastors are afraid to talk about real issues for fear that man will leave their church. Well, I'm not, I'm not afraid, praise God, because it's God's church. It's not my church. It's his church. And I believe that he's going to bring people to, to come around me and this leadership team and, and support what we're doing and, and what I believe God's called us to do. <clears throat> and I've trusted him with that. And that's why some of you are here and have been with me for the last 16 months since we've become a body of believers. And so these are things that I'm talking about. But, you know, we've got to get to where we walk in unity. Unity is important. If we really want to see the power of God in our midst, we have to be on one accord. We have to begin to think alike. We have to have the same motive. We have to see that, that all we want to really do is to exalt Jesus and not man. Come on, amen? We got enough of that today in the body of Christ. Everybody's chasing around the super dupers. I don't know where my water went. I guess Rodney forgot about me, didn't he? Oh, thank you, Rod. I repent. Sorry, brother. I love you. Rodney? Okay. It took both of them to do it? Oh. One to hold the cup, the other one to pour. Praise God. They're too busy laughing at my hat. I'm going to buy y'all a hat like mine. But, um, so that's basically what we've been talking about. So if, you, if, you're, at, if you're at Acts chapter 2, we're going to pick up right there. And in verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost has fully come, they were all with one accord in that place. Here's the same thing we're seeing. Uh, when the day of Pentecost fully came, meaning that the sun had completely rose, the day had be begun, amen. It says that they were on one accord. I truly believe this is where the power started. Because you know that Jesus told them to go in uh, Luke chapter 49. He said, tarry. In the city of Jerusalem, until you are abdued or endued with power from on high. So this was a commandment that Jesus gave to the early disciples. Notice I said commandment. Uh-oh. It wasn't a suggestion. Hey, well, if you got time, go down there and wait in Jerusalem and get filled with the Holy Ghost. It was a commandment. Why? Because it's necessity for us to be filled with power, to be endued with power, if we're ever going to fulfill the call of God on our life. Amen? You're not going to do it just being born again. I'm here to tell you. That might hurt your feelings. It might offend you. I love you. i got to tell you the truth. You need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you're ever going to fulfill the call of God on your life, you need to be filled filled and endued with power on high. Jesus never did a miracle one until he was baptized with the Holy Ghost. Then he went out into Cana and turned the water into wine. Check me out. See if I'm right. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. John said that the spirit like a dove, it wasn't a bird, it was like a dove. Come on, amen. You get charismatic. You start talking about birds flying everywhere and feathers out of the ceiling. It was like a bird and it descended on them and it remained there, the scripture says. It's important that we understand that. Jesus operated in the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because it confirmed that he was sent from the Father. How many know today when we operate in the gifts of the Holy Ghost, it confirms that we're disciples of Jesus. 
and that the power of God is manifested in our lives. We see another, another place. If you turn over with me quickly over to Acts chapter 4, I'm going to jump ahead, but it's just something I want to kind of tie into what I'm saying here. If you look over in a um, wonderful chapter there, but if you look in Acts chapter 4, and you start in verse 29, it says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant us thy servants with all boldness that they might speak the word. I love this. I can't help. I have to park here for a minute. Notice what he said. They didn't say, Lord, take the circumstances away. How many of y'all hear that a lot being prayed in the church today? Notice how the early disciples prayed. They said, Lord, grant us boldness. Well, how many know they had that boldness when they were endued with power from on high? See, here's another thing. You need the boldness of the Holy Ghost. In fact, Audrey had a teaching. It was called Holy Ghost Boldness. And uh, she was here recently in our church. She was ministering on, on, on several things. But I listened to her message on that. And she was talking along these lines about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And one of the uh, clear characteristics of the baptism, and I'll disagree with mainline Pentecostals because they believe that it's always the evidence of speaking in tongues, and I disagree with that. I believe that the first manifestation that we see is a Holy Ghost boldness. Amen? Someone who's bold. That's what we saw with Peter as we get into the text a little bit further. We see a boldness. We see a radical shift from Peter uh, denying Christ then standing up before the Sanhedrin and the same people that crucified Jesus saying he is the Messiah he is the Christ this is the one knowing that the same people could just crucify him in a few minutes but he had a Holy Ghost boldness for the truth of God's word but he says this I'm going to go on I can't spend all day here it says by stretching forth thine hand to heal and signs and wonders come on somebody may be done in the name of thy holy uh, child Jesus and when they prayed now notice what he says next verse 31 the place was shaken where they were assembled together and when they were all filled with the Holy Ghost they spoke the word of God with boldness notice what he said the whole place was shaken there was such an anointing and such a, 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 a one accord amongst the believers that it shook the foundations of the building that they were in. Now, you ought to just underline that in your Bible. I believe it happens today. I've heard testimonies where believers in third world countries come together and it literally is like an earthquake. They get to praying in one accord and believe in God and there's such a spirit of love and just exalting Jesus as king and putting him in his proper place that there is such a supernatural manifestation of the glory of God that people say they can hear earthquakes, that the ground trembles. Isn't that awesome? How many of y'all would like to come to church next Sunday and the whole building just shakes like we've had a, you know, uh, one of those big earthquakes out in, uh, in uh, California where I need to be surfing right now? But that would, that, that would be what it was like when these early believers got together because they were on one accord. There wasn't, you know, all these differences on whether you believe this and you believe that and all these doctrinal views and they weren't indoctrinated with all this garbage today and being in strife, whether you believe this or you believe that. They all come together and was one on one accord. And when they came together, the power of God showed up. Glory to God. Isn't that awesome? Y'all ain't excited about it. I am. We'll go back to Acts chapter 2. <laughs> In verse 2 it says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty or rushing mighty wind. Notice it says as. There wasn't a wind that showed up that day. And the reason I got to say that is because I think... <laughs> Especially in the Pentecostal church today. It's almost like when people come. And this is why I have such a hard time leading people in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because they've just been around flaky, kooky people. Can I just say that? Is that all right? Just kooky, flaky, weird people. And so when you talk to them about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you tell them that, the, that they're born again. That, that the, the Spirit of God, the baptizer is Jesus. Amen. Come on. Uh, Matthew chapter 3 verse 11 John said that Jesus was going to baptize with fire and the Holy Ghost so when I go to talk to him about Jesus being the baptizer and I go to tell him you know as I lay my hands on you that out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water and this, this utterance is going to come forth and if you'll begin to open your mouth by faith it's just like you went to the altar and received Jesus it wasn't goosebumps come on amen you know it wasn't all there wasn't this mighty rushing wind you know when you got born again you just went down there and you believed amen 
but everybody's looking for the Holy Ghost to come out from, you know, <laughs> from behind a tree or, you know, a glory ball is going to bust through the ceiling. And you know what? That's why the enemy uses that stuff. And that's why people have to rationalize this. And they go, well, I don't understand. Am I making things up? And, you know, am I going to get slain? Am I going to fall down right here? No. You're going to operate in it by faith. You're going to receive it as a gift what he says in Luke chapter 11 when he's talking about the earthly father and he says you know you being an earthly father know how to give a good gift how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Ghost to those who ask of him it's for everybody amen it's for everybody. It's not for the super saints it's not for the pastor it's not for the fivefold ministry gift Okay, it's not for the apostles, the evangelists, the it's not, it's for every believer. Mark chapter 16 says, these signs shall follow them who, help me out, believe. And what's he say? You shall cast out devils, you shall speak with new tongues. These are the things the believers are to do. Amen? We've lost that in the church today. Well, we got the other half that are just spooky kooky. <laughs> Nobody wants to be a part of that. Huh? If we're not hanging off the chandeliers and running around knocking chairs over, you know, the, the, the Spirit of God's not moving. The Spirit of God's not flaky. It's genuine. Amen? I knew we weren't going to get far. In verse 3 he says, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and sat upon each of them. There again, notice what he says, as fire you know the word fire there is very significant because if you notice when the pen when the when the baptism or the or the outpouring of the holy spirit rather came there was a there was a cloven tongue like fire and i believe that, that fire in, in is really the, the 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 presence of god you know the powerful presence of God. Just like when, when the Lord uh, ha handed the law down to Moses, what happened? There was fire there. And I believe that fire burns off all the impurities, burns off all the things around us. And, you know, God uses this, this fire to, to kind of show us this glorious presence of who he is. But he says, like. It's, it wasn't a fire, it was like them. And it says, and they all shall be filled with the Holy Ghost and begin to speak with other tongues. Now I want you to underline this in your Bible. Other tongues. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach a little bit on this. Other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. First thing I want you to notice is there's, there's more than one kind of tongue. Amen? There was other tongues that were there. And why it's important to bring that out, because there's doctrines today in the body of Christ, mainly in your main, mainline evangelical, <coughs> that will agree, yeah, they were speaking other tongues. They were known languages. Well, I'll agree with that. We're going to get on in a few verses and see that there were people there that heard their native tongue. But I want you guys to fast forward with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And I'm going to teach you something. Can I teach you all something tonight? Let's go over there. And first, let's actually, let's back up to verse 13, I mean chapter 13, verse 1. This is Paul speaking to give you context. He's bringing correction to the church of Corinth because the church of Corinth have been acting like kooky spookies. They've been acting flaky. They're swinging from the chandeliers. You got people sleeping with their wives, their, their, bro, their, their daddy's wife, and they're getting drunk, and they're just acting foolish. And so Paul's bringing correction to the church. But notice what he says in verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 1. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men, and what? And of angels. Now go back with me to verse four, uh, chapter 14. Verse 14, or chapter 14, and we'll get it right. Pray for me. Follow after charity, and where charity means love, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. Notice verse 2, it says, For he that speaks in an unknown tongue. Now why do I bring that out? Because in Acts chapter 2, it says other tongues. Now we're talking about a different tongue. It says an unknown tongue. See, they heard their native language because they were other tongues, meaning they were other languages. I told the story many times, but it bears repeating. I was in Bible college, and there was a, a professor that taught on the Holy Spirit. And one of the things he said was that, um, you know, he had a church for about 18 years, and he pastored that church. And it was a glorious church, and he built it from, like, I don't know, a couple families to, like, 500 people in Texas. And he was a Southern Baptist preacher. He was raised Southern Baptist. 
uh, was part of the Southern Baptist uh, denomination, was part of their, I think he actually went to their school, the theological seminary. Baptist boy. Got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Anyway, left the Southern Baptist Church and planted uh, a New Testament church. And during this time, he said he had so many wonderful things happen in their midst and in, in, in their services and things like that. But one day, particularly, he said a message of tongues came forth in the service. Now, I want to just go ahead and tell you what that was. That wasn't somebody praying to the Lord. That wasn't an unknown tongue. It was a message of tongues in a service. It was, it's not your prayer language to the Lord. It was a message given. And so he said that he waited on the interpretation. The interpretation never came. He said he never had to cover for God. He just went on with his message and he preached and he said at the end of the message he had given an invitation for salvation and while he gave that invitation this lady got up in the back row and he never saw her before and she was weeping and crying and she had a very strong accent and it said it was Russian or something like that and she looked over at the man that gave the message in tongues and she said I want to know about this Jesus that that man told me about earlier that man had spoke her native language and so God will do things like that. How many know God's concerned about one person coming into the kingdom? Amen. He said it's his will for none to perish, but all come to repentance. Glory to God. And so there's times that a message of tongues will be given. But notice what he says here. He says, but he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto, somebody help me out, men, but unto God. So we're talking about a totally different tongue right here. He says, but unto God, for no man understandeth how about he speaketh mysteries. So Paul talks about this, this unknown tongue not being another tongue, being an unknown tongue. This is the tongues that we see clearly as we continue in the book of Acts. You'll never see another example in the book of Acts where tongues were spoken and other people understood what they said. Check me out. Check me out. Call me on it. There's not another place. Every other time that the tongues were spoken in the book of Acts, and you can check me out. You can go to Acts chapter 8. Uh, you can go over to Acts chapter 19. There are several places. There's no place where anybody heard their native language. Why? Because the tongues that were being demonstrated there was a confirmation of the filling of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's important that you understand that. You'll get people say, well, you know, let's look at Paul's letter over here. And if, if, you, if you come over here in verse 14, I had some guy tell me this one time. And, he, and he's talking about where he was saying, let me find it for you real quick. This is a sign. Over in verse 12, 12 through the 14th chapter is where you're going to get your most teaching on spiritual gifts. 12 starts talking about the gifts, and Paul categorizes them. And the first three we talk about is the revelatory gifts, uh, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, um, prophecy, or, or diverse kinds of tongues, interpretations of tongues. And then we move on into the power gifts, what I like to say, the gifts of healing, the gifts of faith, the manifestation of the power gifts. And then uh, we go on into the, the last gifts, and the last gifts are, somebody help me out. The last gifts, hmm? There's relevatory, there's power, and there's what? No, interpretation's the first one. Come on, scholars. The last bit of the gifts that we're talking about. Let's look at it. There's tongues. Huh? Teaching. Prophecy. But notice what he says. Let's, let's look at verse 11. After he, get, he gives all the diversities, he says the manifestation of the revelatory, the power gifts, the vocal gifts. Talking about the vocal gifts. 
The revelatory gifts are the gifts that when we, when we get a word of wisdom, we get a revelation about somebody and we use this. Jesus used this with the woman at the well. When he saw the woman and he started reading her mail and she said, I perceive you're a prophet. And he started telling her, that's right, you said right. You ain't got a husband and the five you had ain't your husband. How many of you know he was, he was operating in a word of knowledge? He knew something and she knew that what he knew could only come from God because he didn't know her and she didn't know him. But then we get on to the last group of gifts, and that's the vocal, uh, the, the vocal gifts, which are the, word, uh, the, the gifts of tongues and things like that. But this is what he says in verse 11. He says, But all these worketh that one in the same spirit, dividing every man severally as he wills. It's important that you understand that, because it's as the spirit wills when we're talking about the gifts. Now, I jumped off that to say this. When we were talking about that, I had a young man challenge me. And he's talking about over in verse 30. If you look over here, he says this. Have all the gifts of healing. Do all speak with tongues. And the man came out of a Baptist denomination. He said, here's Paul saying, do we all speak with tongues? Well, let's look at the context. See, there again, we need to understand the context of what Paul's talking about. Paul is talking about in verse, in chapter 12, about the gifts in a church service. So... Does everybody stand up in a church service and give a message in tongues? No. Does everybody have the ability to? As the Spirit wills, they do. But everybody's not going to operate in that gift. But that's not an unknown tongue that we're talking about here when we're looking at the text. That is another gift. That is a gift of tongues. Not your prayer language that you receive with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Does everybody get that? Does everybody understand that? Is that, is, that, is that confusing for anybody? Because I want to clarify that. Because it's important that you understand that. And so we go back over to, let's fall back over to Acts. And pick up there. And so he says, He began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It's important that you understand this. The Spirit is what gives utterance. God is not going to move your mouth. Amen? <laughs> Again, I, I, this is what I come up against all the time. That, that, you know, they think it's the supernatural thing that's going to happen. And, you know, they're not going to have any control. I can turn on. I can speak in tongues right now. I can stop speaking in tongues. I, I have the ability to pray in the Holy Ghost. I have the ability to sing in the Spirit. I can do all that. Why? Because it's my prayer language. And I can turn it off and on when I want to. Amen? It's not the same as if I'm in a service. And all of a sudden, I get this prompting from the Holy Ghost. And I get this feeling. And I know that I've got a message for this congregation. And then I stand up in front of a church service And I give a message in tongues And guess what, a few seconds later Somebody, Kimberly, stands up in a few minutes and goes I feel like this is what the Lord is saying ta, 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 And she gives the interpretation It's not the same Now you might come in here And there's people that's coming in this church And they hear us worshiping And they hear us singing in the spirit And praying in the spirit and they think, well, you're out of control No Because we're speaking unto God Not to man we're speaking mysteries. We're exercising our prayer language. It's important that you understand that. Because this has been so much controversy. And let me tell you why it's controversy. Because the devil don't want you speaking in tongues. Why? Because there's power. Because when you speak in tongues, you speak the perfect will of God. See, we can ask amiss when we're in our, in our normal um, prayer time with God. Huh? It's still filtering through. A natural man. And so oftentimes we say, Father, I thank you, Lord. And I, I, you know, we're in our prayer time and we're praying to God. And we're saying, Lord, I want you to give me this because I'm going to do this. And you know what? We may be asking with the wrong motive. That's what James said. He said, you have not but because you, you ask not. But then he says, you have not because you ask him this. See, but when we pray in the Holy Ghost, we are praying the perfect wisdom of God. And guess what? It's always right. I spend most of my time praying in tongues. I, I very little pray in English. In fact, some of you, when I get a visual picture of you, and I, and I don't know what's going on in your situation, but the Lord lays you on my heart, and I just get a, a picture, or maybe I, I just get a picture of what I saw you sitting and wearing in Sunday. And then all of a sudden, I go to praying in the Spirit. Why? Because I'm praying the perfect wisdom of God over your life. Isn't that good? See, I'm not putting any of me in it. I'm, I'm praying spirit to spirit. My spirit is communicating perfectly to the spirit of God. Man, that is awesome. That is one powerful truth. 
And so I know I'm praying the perfect will all the time. When there's time I need wisdom and I don't know what to do, I just start praying in the Holy Ghost. I say, Lord, I don't know what to do in this thing. And I just start praying in the Holy Ghost. And guess what? All of a sudden, I start getting, I start getting revelation. Why? Because I'm praying the perfect wisdom of God. And guess what? He's downloading back into me. And guess what? Now my mind is starting to be fruitful. And I'm starting to realize, okay, I see a picture or I, I get a word or something. And I say, this is what I need to do. I'm telling you. This is what Paul's talking about when he's talking about the mysteries over in 1 Corinthians. He's talking about when we speak mysteries in an unknown tongue, we're speaking mysteries unto God. He said, these tongues are not for men. They're for you. And they're for every single one of you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is good. It's not a bad thing. It's not a weird thing. It's a good thing. Jesus talked more about it in John chapter 14 through the 17th verse than he talked about anything. He said when the comforter comes, he said he'll lead you and guide you into all things. He said it's better that I go because when I go, my Father's going to send the promise. Hallelujah. And in Luke 24 and verse 49, that promise was to go tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. I don't know how people get through this life and not be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I, I don't know how they do it. I guess some of them just got easy going personalities and things like that, but I couldn't make it. There ain't no way if I couldn't draw on that power that I got on the inside of me, that I couldn't draw on the wisdom of God, that I couldn't draw when, I, when things, sometimes that's all I, you know, I'm, my pastor's going through something right now. Very, very difficult situation. And he said, Sean, I just find myself waking up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and just crying out and crying out in tongues. He said, the other day I just walked over the bridge over in Titusville. It's a big causeway where I'm from. And um, he said, you know, I just walked over. I got up and left my house at 3 o'clock in the morning. And he said, I just cried out in tongues and just, just walked that bridge. It was three miles one way and three miles the other way. Just, just praying and crying out to God and just getting, getting wisdom from God. And he said, man, you know what? When I got through praying and stuff, he said, God just started downloading things to me. Started sharing things with me, giving me nuggets, giving me words. And he said, man, I came back so full of God's power and supercharged. Come on, somebody. He just felt like going and charging hell with a water pistol. Huh? Because he, In fact, Jude puts it this way. Jude said, Beloved, pray in the Holy Ghost, building up your most holy faith. That's what Jude says. See, it supercharges us like batteries. Y'all ever have a, you know, I, I, one of my teachers gave this analogy, and it, I like this. You've probably heard this if you've been around the Charismatic Word of Faith Church long, but it's like a battery. There ain't nothing more sickening than getting in a car, and you know this, Bert, and you're ready to go to work, and you put the key in, and it goes, Huh? You put the key in, and you're getting ready to go to town, or you're getting ready to go to work, and you've got to be there, and you turn the key over, and it goes, That's a sickening sound, ain't it? And you get that fresh, hot battery, what happens when you turn that key on? That's what it's like when you're praying in the Holy Ghost. When you're drained down and you're, and you're getting whipped by all the things in life, you start praying in tongues and building up your most holy faith. Guess what? It's like a supercharger. It's like you've been put on that battery charger and all of a sudden, boom, I'm ready to go. Praise God. Shandalala, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Like I said, I'm ready to go charge hell with a water pistol. Why? Because it's building up my faith. And I don't understand it. In my mind, it's not fruitful. But I know one thing. I'm praying the perfect wisdom of God. And when I pray the perfect wisdom of God, I begin to get strong. Stirred up in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Y'all ain't getting this tonight, are you? It'll catch you later. In verse 5, he says, And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, and the Jews, and devout men of every nation. This is what we were talking about. In verse 6, he says, Notice now that when the noise abroad and the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard his language, uh, heard him speak in his own language. And they all were amazed and marveled, saying one another, Behold, are these not... Um, all these which speak Galatians so they were dumbfounded they were like isn't these just Galatians how are they hearing all their native languages now there's some controversy over this too so you know you might hear one scholar say this and another scholar say something else but we know that there was 120 in the upper room right amen now I believe the whole 120 got baptized in the Holy Ghost why because Mark chap ch chapter 16 says those who believe so I don't believe it was just the 12 or the 11 rather um, that were up there speaking in an unknown tongue. I believe that there was 
all of them here. So yes, out of all of them speaking, I would dare to say that there was probably 12 or 15 languages being spoken. But how many of you know, I'll just go ahead and take some liberty. There were some tongues being spoken that nobody knew what it was. Why? Because they were unknown tongues. They were tongues of angels. There was angelic tongues going on. And people were marveling at these ordinary men at 9 o'clock in the morning speaking in unknown languages. The same men that had been with Jesus. The same men that they said, these are ordinary men. Unlearned men is what they called them. But now they were bold. Standing up, speaking with power and authority. Glory to God. He goes on and says, And how were every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parth Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, and the dwellers of uh, Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia or Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and I ain't even going to attempt that one. Y'all help me out. And uh, Egypt and the parts of Libya and Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, and do hear them in their own tongues the wonderful works of God. These people were amazed. And in verse 12, he says it this way: He says, and they were all amazed and were in and were in doubt, saying to one another, what does this mean? They wanted to know what happened. What glorious thing happened that would cause all these ordinary, unlearned men to be speaking in unknown languages that they could hear completely their own native language and hearing all these things that were taking place. But notice what it says in verse 13. It says, others mocking, saying, these men are full of wine. You know what? It doesn't matter how many miracles happen. Some people are just so full of unbelief. It just amazes me. It amazes me the people I minister to. People get healed, they're around, things like that, but yet they're skeptics on everything. Does it hurt to believe? <laughs> It's amazing to me. I had a friend that, you know, he, he died and he took his own life. And, you know, I tried to minister to him all the time. And one time he got real angry at me. He said, Boone, what if it's a 2,000-year-old lie? I said, what if it ain't? You're basing your eternity on a what if. I don't believe he knew the Lord and I think he perished. But it's amazing to me. God can manifest his power. People be getting healed. And, and you still have these skeptics. That's what I loved about the old healing revivals. You know, all the skeptics would go to disprove like Kathleen Kuhlman and, and all these wonderful healing evangelists. And guess what? While they were there to discredit and, you know, do all these things, they'd get healed themselves. The power of God would come on them. And God would make them a believer. They'd be there to, you know, to, to discredit and talk against this word of faith crap, this mess. This is of the devil. And then they show up and glory to God, my back just got healed. <laughs> the power of God just ran through me like a lightning rod. And then they believed. That's why it's so important that we operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Because it confirms the word. It confirms the word. In the last part of uh, uh, Mark chapter 16, it says, Then they went confirming the word with, with signs and wonders. So what happens? When the word of God is being preached, full of God's power and his glory, guess what? There's signs and wonders that follow the word. And there ain't nothing quicker to get somebody converted. You ain't got to give them the four spiritual laws and say, Will you pray and repeat a prayer when I lay my hands on you and whatever's ailing you automatically gets supernaturally healed. I mean, you know, I ain't got to sit there and persuade you and go with every head bowed and every eye closed if you're here today and you don't know Jesus and coax you to the altar. Huh? Let somebody get healed of some type of, you know, infirmity. Hey, they're believers. They know they were sick. They know that they were, you know, got a bad report from the doctor. Come on, amen. And then they got miraculously healed. You ain't got to, you ain't got to lead them down the road. They're going to, they're going to go to Jesus themselves. That's why we need the power gifts. That's why we need to operate in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because there's a lost and dying world that needs to know this ain't an empty gospel church. That we have the same authority that Jesus had. Just as Jesus was in this world, so are we. Praise God. That makes some religious people mad. You stand up and tell somebody that one. How dare you say, well, read the Bible. That's what the Bible says. Just as Jesus was, so are we in this world. Just as he, I'm everything that he is in my recreated, born-again spirit. 
totally righteous, holy, perfected, got all nine gifts of the Spirit, got all the fruit of the Spirit, glory to God, all the glory of God. I ain't got to sing about the glory. The glory's on the inside of me, church. The glory's on the inside of you if you're born again. Every bit of the glory of God is walking around on the inside of you. Now we just need to renew our mind to it and begin to appropriate it by faith and begin to release the power of God through what we say and what we do. Glory to God. I tell you what, I got a, I got a uh, report this week. I prayed for, um, I was with Adrian. Adrian's not here tonight. But uh, we were doing things for the church. Just doing what we do. Going and getting our desks from over in Swanee County. And we got donated desks. And it was Teresa, crazy self, and all of us all. I was trapped in with women and Rodney and... It was a nut. I had pastor all squished up in the back of the truck. We were like a bunch of teenagers. And so we're doing what we do. We're just doing ministry, you know. We're going to get in the desk and doing all this stuff. And Adrian says, Pastor, can we go by this house? And we're going to pray for my friend. I said, sure. So we get out and I meet this girl. And she has a little baby. And her husband's in our rap. And um, he's been on, a, I think, his second tour. And they just diagnosed him with some kind of, and I'm not even going to attempt to try to repeat what it was, but it was an infirmity that had this man completely, he couldn't eat. I mean, it just, just totally destroyed his immune system. And she was in tears. She said, I, I don't know what to do. He's over there. Can you imagine a wife? She's got a, new, you know, a, a newly born baby. Her husband's over there on the other side of the world. And all she's getting is a phone call, and he's not doing good. And so I listened to her, and I, you know, I just let, let her just share everything that was going on. And when she got through, I, I told her, I said, do you believe God can heal your husband from right here? And she said, I do. And I said, we're going to pray and believe. I said, God's going to touch your husband. So we began to pray. And I said, there's no distance between him and the Holy Ghost. His name was Cody. And I said, Lord, I thank you right now that the healing power of God right now is coming upon that man. I said, I just released the life of God. I started praying in that way. And man, we got done, and yesterday I got a testimony that he not only was feeling better, but this is the first time in six weeks, he left his bed and was on his post working. Glory to God. 24 hours, less than 24 hours that we stood and prayed. Praise God. I tell you, I was listening to Curry Blake on the way here. I've got your CDs now. I just robbed them from... I've been just saturating myself with Curry Blake recently. He's the successor of John G. Lake Ministries. I know you guys probably heard of John G. Lake. John G. Lake has seen over, I think, over 100,000 documented healings. In fact, they gave him a doctor's license in Spokane, Washington. Is that correct? And he, wasn't, he hadn't even been to nursing school. But he had these sick places where he would line up the sick, and he had hospitals of people, well places. What did they call them? healing rooms and he would believe God he would tell you that he would give you $500 if you didn't get healed in 30 days he would sit with you until you, your, your healing would completely manifest that's how much this guy walked in the, the power of God and the anointing of God but I was listening to, to the, these, these CDs over the last few days and I just realized that it's so simple you need somebody to help you mess it up We've been taught so much religion and so much we've got to have a formula. And if we've got to say this just right and we've got to lay our hands and go, power just right. And uh, we've got to do all these kooky stuff or the power of God doesn't work. But see, that's not the way the kingdom was set up. It's so simple a kid can do it. It's so simple that all we have to do is come with childlike faith, believing that the same power that raised Christ Jesus on the dead, come on somebody, lives on the inside of me. And then when I lay my hands on them, just like the scripture says, we shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. When I speak the word of God, it will not return void. It will go and do what it says it will do. When I release the word of God, it will heal them and deliver them from their destruction. Psalms 107 says, on and on and go. But we just got to get that revelation on the inside of us and stay away from naysayers and people who are baptized in unbelief that say that ain't for today well get away from me because it's working don't wake me up it's working for me praise God huh oh yeah I laid hands on her mom yes and this isn't me please hear me I know I'm saying me a lot but we didn't even tell her we were coming down but we were we were over at yeah Mm-hmm. 
time to say, I don't want pastor laying hands. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Her neck, she had a, when I got to the house, she had a big old heating or ice or I don't know what it was, heating pad. And I went in, I said, is it all right if I pray for your leg? <laughs> I thought it was her knee. And, uh, and she said, pastor, it's her neck. It gave it away with the big neck brace, huh? <laughs> I know. Y'all could tell I used to do a lot of drugs back in the day. I said, uh, I said glory to God. So, uh, <laughs> so I went over there. <laughs> And laid my hands on her neck, real simple, just commanded healing. I spoke to every muscle, every joint, every ligament, every, every um, nerve. And the next day, and that, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. She got messed up with Jesus, didn't she? Glory to God. She was outside doing yard work. Glory to God. Y'all don't wake me up. It's working. You know, he said that there's less than 10%. Curry Blake said this. Less than 10% of churches are actually seeing. Or not 10%. Churches are seeing less than 10% healed. And I, and I know y'all are going to think this is haughty. And that's not me. It's this church. But I promise you we're seeing 50% of people that we heal for. That we pray for healing as being ministered to. and being. Fit. I would say 5 out of 10 people are being healed in this church. Glory to God. Give the Lord a hand, I tell you. You know why? Because we're a word church and we believe the word. We don't believe what man says. We don't believe what we've been indoctrinated and what grandpa said and what pastor so-and-so said and bishop so-and-so. No, I believe what the word of God said. And the word of God says I can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And as long as they're sick folk, I'm going to lay hands on them. And as long as there are people that need Jesus, I'm going to preach Jesus. When I preach Jesus, people don't get saved all the time. But I'm not going to quit preaching Jesus. Amen? And that's the way we need to be. And I know I need to tighten up. So let me just wind this on up. And he says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell in Jerusalem, and you known unto you, and hearken to my words. Peter saying, Pay attention. Verse 15, For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing that it's the third hour of the day. Well, there are people around Lake City get drunk at 9 a.m., but maybe it was a little different over there. <laughs> But he says, but this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. Now here we're talking about a messianic prophecy that was given in chap Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. And this is what he says. We'll go on to read it. And he says this. He says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall proph prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, old men see dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days in my spirit and they shall prophesy and I shall show wonders in the heaven above and signs and earth beneath blood and fire and vapor and smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great day a notable day of the Lord shall come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Glory to God. This was the prophesy. Can I tell you in Acts chapter Chapter 2, this was fulfilled when it said there came a sound like a mighty Russian wind. And I want to tell you today, we need to quit singing songs and praying, come Holy Spirit, come. Because he came 2,000 years ago. Is anybody hearing me? And he already poured out his spirit. And now it's time for the church to rise up and begin to prophesy and begin to do the works that Jesus did. And I want to tell you, I'm going to be part of that last time prophecy. I'm going to be part of that latter rain that Jesus talked about coming. And all I'm saying is that if we don't get a revelation of what he was saying in this text and begin to do the works that Jesus did and greater works, guess what? There's a whole generation that's going straight to hell because they don't want to hear about this empty gospel. They want to know why I should serve your God. We live in a pagan, gosh, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. We are one generation away from total, utter paganism. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to take the power of God showing up at Walmart. It's going to take the power of God showing up at your workplace. It's going to take the power of God showing up at your school. It's going to take the power of God to set somebody free for them to say, I believe you're God. I believe Jesus was God. Not a cozy little salvation message. Paul said, I didn't come with persuasive words. He said, I came with demonstration and power. Glory to God. 
Paul wasn't a great speaker. He wasn't very impressive with his looks neither. But when Paul showed up, he said, wait till I get there. Because when I show up, we'll see. <laughs> That's what Paul said. When I, when I get there, we'll see who's got the real message. Why? Because Paul knew when he began to speak the word of God, things begin to change from the spiritual to the natural. Come on, somebody. Things begin to manifest. He brought things out of the spiritual, and they begin to manifest in the natural. And guess what? Lives begin to change. People begin to set free. Infirmities begin to go. Devils begin to be casted out. It's the same gospel. Jesus said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I change not. Same gospel. We serve a God who can do creative miracles that can raise the dead, set the captives free. He wants to do it in each and every one of you. The problem is, are you going to be usable? Quit praying, God, use me. Start praying, God, make me usable. That I can start to declare your works and do the things that you said that I can do. Would you stand with me tonight? Hallelujah. Well, the first step that we have to do is first we just have to receive. We have to get to a place that no matter what we've been taught, what does the Word say? And as I shared tonight, the Word says that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not only good, but it's for you. It's for each and every one of you. And it's not just so you can go and talk in tongues. <laughs> it's so you can complete the ministry, the plan of God that He has for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans to give you a hope and a future. In fact, the King James says, to give you an expected end. Glory to God. And that expected end needs the power of God operating in your life. For you to get to that expected end, you simply cannot do it without being endued with power from on high. And so with every head bow and every eye closed,